the list of individuals on the website as well, but let me start by saying that you know, uh, this is a uh, workshop that is organized by the Developing Country Center of Cybercrime. It's a small center that's been set up in the South to help uh, developing countries, specifically to help with their legislation and capacity building later to cybercrime and law. Um, today on the panel, uh, we are joined by Ana Neves from the Portuguese government. She's a person who, who I write, basically. She's been involved in, in a lot of the ICT and IT discussions from the Portuguese government's perspective as well in cybersecurity. And Jantha Fernando, he's with the uh, Sri Lankan government, um, has been deeply involved in and uh, related issues in Sri Lanka. Uh, there's myself, I am from Pakistan. I've worked on our cybercrime and cybersecurity legislation in Pakistan and also in the, in the region in South Asia. Uh, we have Bevel. Uh, who's here from the Packet Clearinghouse, has had a lot of extensive experience from the Caribbean, and will share that with us today. And we have Audrey Polk from Intel, representing the business sector and their views on, on these sort of issues. Uh, so what I'll do, basically, in, right as we start, is to um, conduct a sort of a short presentation, uh, probably about 10 minutes, not longer, to sort of set the scene and give you an idea of what we're trying to sort of uh, do with today's presentation, or today's workshop and move on from there to the panels, panelists, and then, you know, we would like to get a lot more interaction actually from the uh, audience and answer questions and hopefully address any concerns or queries that you might have. Okay, so let me see if we can get this up on the screen. Here we go. Okay, so um, the idea basically today is to discuss uh, whether a treaty on cybercrime is helpful, one in general, and secondly, if it has advantages for developing countries, what is it that it brings to them, what kind of problems it can resolve, what kind of uh, uh, issues can it address, for instance. And so those problems that are faced by developing countries, we can discuss that a little bit. I, I speak to law enforcement all the time, or even users who have been affected by crimes, somebody's been a victim of a financial crime, Somebody may have other sort of problems or social network issues, uh, social network uh, issues that they've faced, and eventually, when they end up going in their developing countries to uh, their law enforcement, the response usually is either slow, or we are not really sure how we're going to handle this, or there is no legislation. And so, the most important thing we generally see is that sometimes the the response is, "I'm sorry, the law does not." absolutely cover this aspect, maybe we can try to find a solution in some other law. And so the process becomes effectively slow, inefficient, and is unable to satisfy the demand of users in uh, developing countries as to be protected uh, uh, under cybercrime legislation. Also, the law enforcement is unable to do many things that many developing, developed countries might be able to do is have the relevant procedures and powers that the law provides them. Examples this is not a holistic list, but there are certain examples like, you know, having a preservation request. It's a new concept, freezing basically data. It, it doesn't necessarily exist in most developing countries. Uh, and so that's the first thing a law enforcement official will want to do if he get, receives a complaint from a user or a victim saying, could you, the ISP or a, or, or, or a service provider, immediately freeze data? Production orders, could you release some of this data so we can then use it in our investigation? Being able to do search and seizure electronically, not just walking in, picking up laptops and servers and things like that, but actually doing technical search and seizures. And disclosure of partial traffic data, real-time collection. These are, these are things that they do not have necessarily in their legislations. Practically on the other side, which is related to law, is the issue of how do I trace down who did this? How do I find out who's, whose IP this is? Uh, those kind of skills. How do we get behind proxies, for instance, to figure out if this is a you know, child pornography case or a phishing fraud? Who's actually doing this? Is this being hosted on a server that is being run by a legitimate company, but it's actually been taken over by some criminals, uh, and, and the company or the bank doesn't even know about it? So how do we trace these folks? Uh, how do we collect intelligence about uh, this sort of crime in, in, you know, for, the, uh, for criminal purposes, how do we, how do we collect this, this information? And I think that's, that's really, really important. The only way you can do that is if you have a live, real-time network, uh, what, we, what is known as a 24-7 network. Usually the 24-7 network, which means 24 hours, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, it is up, and it's a network of individuals who will pick up the phone and respond. And usually it's in a, in a global um, uh, situation, but you know, it might also be relatable to a national 
situation, for instance, if you need assistance uh, from cybercrime cells or investigators on the ground in your countries. And as I said, the skills, not just the law, but the skills to do search, seizure, evidence collection, are, and, and forensic capability to be able to uh, get behind and collect the evidence and look at the evidence and prove by actually getting the evidence that in fact there is a, uh, a crime that has been committed tends to be a challenge at times. The other thing that I, which, which, which we find and, and I found it whenever I've gone and spoken to any sort of regional law enforcement is saying, well, you know, cybercrime's biggest problem is it's offshore. It's cross-border, trans-border, it's outside my country. The moment I hit a, a, a Yahoo or a Gmail or a Hotmail account, that's where my you know, investigation pretty much ends. What do I do next? Because I, can't, I can send a request out to ser service providers abroad, but I guess I should go through the mutual legal assistance treaty if I have one. Most, a lot of developing countries don't necessarily have mutual legal assistance treaties with the countries they need to necessarily get the data from, which could be the U.S., could be European Union, could be Japan, could be places where basically most of the data is actually stored. And the responses they sometimes get is, well, my law is different from the law that exists in, uh, say, the, the, the U.S. or in the European Union. My procedures are different. I, I, this is not how I do the processing of procedures. So if they, even if they get a request coming from a country outside uh, of their own and asking for assistance, they will say, well, that's not how we do things in my country. So there's a lack of harmonization of procedures as well. And obviously the biggest issue is that the data obviously is held in the West. So, you know, how do I get to that data and that evidence? The other issue is when you do start asking from some developing countries, I mean, I know in my country we have this issue, for instance, and, and in others within our region sometimes, when we request data or request information or assistance from service providers, the first response would be, I don't know if you're from a country which has enough safeguards or human rights protections and civil liberties, so I'm not sure whether I should cooperate. I need to do my assessment. And that's a fair point because the, that service provider is risking the possibility that they could be sued for a human rights violation where they are at. So sometimes you don't necessarily get that co cooperation and you, you may or may not be part of that therefore trusted network that will cooperate and give you that assistance. Imagine the kind of things and I'll sort of give you an idea as, as, as you know, if you're, a, if you're an investigator and you want to be able to capture an image of a website so it's access to an open network outside your country. So if you were to go to a website of CNN.com and there was some information there and as a, as a law enforcement or investigator you're trying to capture that information, the first question is, well, that information is not on a server in your country, uh, say in India or Sri Lanka or Pakistan or anywhere else. That information lies in a U.S. server. Uh, when you're capturing that information, even though it's showing up on your screen, is that the right way to capture that information? That's a technical issue with a defense attorney in a cybercrime case will bring up. Access of closed data abroad by persons in country voluntarily. So if you come across an individual who's a criminal and who's using, uh, say, a Yahoo Mail account, that mail account happens to be hosted in a country outside yours. Uh, maybe it's yahoo.co.uk, for instance. Um, and that is a U US, UK server, or at least the, the, because of the, uh, the domain name, uh, the CCTLU would be the, the, would be the jurisdiction of the UK. Now, if that person is, is actually in your own country, in your developing country, and you, you are able to ask him to open up that email and show you that data and share that data while he's in your developing country, but he's accessing this data off from a UK server, the question is whether that data that is coming across is something that you can take to court and does your law authorize that or, or was that actually transport or access which was not authorized. So this is something that would need to be addressed and would need to be taken care of in national legislation and otherwise as well. Then there's the other aspect. If you were to try and contact an ISP for instance or a provider from your developing country abroad to say again UK, US or Japan or elsewhere. If they shared the data with you voluntarily, if they decided to do so, is that legal? What law would cover it? Would it be covered under a treaty? Because again, the, the reason I bring this up is maybe you can get the information, but at the end of the day you want to prosecute the criminal and the defense attorney of the criminal is going to bring up these issues in court saying, I'm sorry, this evidence has to be excluded from the trial because the evidence wasn't properly obtained through a legal channel. So that could be an issue as well. So what, what do we need, therefore, in international cooperation? We need an international binding obligation to cooperate. That's the biggest problem that law enforcement in, in, in countries have, that when I ask for a request, even if it's through an MLAT, sometimes I don't get the response. So I need a binding mechanism by which I can actually get a effective, efficient, uh, maybe not real-time, but you know, some assistance through a 24-7 network. 
Now, who, uh, what's, what's the, the, the group that you would get this, this response and what kind of an international treaty, well, what are the members of this treaty? Well, you could have a bilateral in, uh, international treaty. People, I come from, from Pakistan, so people have suggested maybe there should be a treaty between India and Pakistan on criminal matters and other things, which I think is a great idea. The trouble is, when the server is in a third country, that bilateral treaty between just the two countries is totally and utterly useless. So, does it mean that we should have a regional arrangement? Does it, is it sufficient for maybe 10 or 12 countries to be part of a treaty? Again, the data could be in a third location and you wouldn't be able to get to it. So the greater the outreach, the, the, if it's multilateral and the, the more regions that are covered as a part of that treaty, the more useful that would be. So therefore, it would be probably, in my, at least in my view, an international treaty that would cover it. And that would be the answer that we're looking for. And that was the purpose of basically sort of starting this debate, and we'll go to the panel in a, in a few seconds. But what should a treaty like that have? I guess it should try addressing all the problems that we, we just looked at in slide two and three. Number one, it should try and harmonize the legislations across those members. It should not be technologically specific because, remember, I mean, it's, if, if you talk about social networks and we talk about Facebook, you go back about five years and people would never have thought that you needed to have an offense related to social networks. So defining crimes on the basis of technology does not work in the long run. And you cannot negotiate treaties every three or four years. It has to be something that has to be uh, defined in a non-technologically you know, neutral manner. So otherwise it becomes archaic. Uh, also, you're going to have difficulty getting consensus on everything. Um, I come from, say, Pakistan. I have a, you know, we have religious views. Can I get other countries who have the same views to agree to a treaty? Probably not. It'll be very difficult. So you need a treaty that actually has consensus, that people agree on it, which means that not everything necessarily will be part of it, but some of it might be. So in the baseline, an inclusive treaty that basically is able to give you a baseline, uh, may not cover everything, but covers sufficiently the really difficult things that we're trying to deal with in cybercrime. The other thing we would have to do also is help in harmonizing the procedures so that when one law enforcement calls up another law enforcement, what ends up happening is that they understand what powers and procedures they have to use so that the cooperation is more effective and, and is, 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 is quicker. And when it's not just your procedures on the ground that are the same, but guess what, you may, may need to harmonize how you communicate with each other, which is also important, so that you do it in a cooperative and an efficient fashion. Again, it's also important that this treaty should not be something that says, well, if you're a member of this treaty, you cannot be a member of any other treaty. That's, that's not going to work either. So it needs to be an open platform treaty, uh, something that's complementary, that is not exclusive to anything else, and, but, and is therefore inclusive. So, you know, who would you want to have as members of this treaty? Uh, would it be for Pakistan sufficient that India, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh were members? No, because... Most of my data, it could be that some of the data would be in India, it could be some of the data maybe in Sri Lanka, but most of my requests for assistance will be to the US, will be to the European Union, will be to the UK, will be to those kind of countries where the data is held. So it should enable cross-border access to open and closed networks as well. So it should be a treaty that says that it is okay for my law enforcement to access and collect evidence which is openly accessible over the internet, or if somebody is able to voluntarily disclose that information from across the border, an ISP or a CCTLD is able to give me that information, which, by the way, is happening every day. So when the law enforcement calls up uh, a provider and says, there's a phishing or fraud case happening, could you please give me some information? I need some data. They are, without this, even trying to cooperate. But again, you can't take that to court because it's not legal, it's not evidence. So you need a legal mechanism that recognizes the right that you would have as a, as, a, as, a, as a law enforcement to be able to get that data, which you're doing on a, on a daily basis anyway, but you need a legal cover for it. So is there a treaty for developing countries that they can join? Well, uh, there, it, 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 it is a, this, is an, this is an interesting debate. Uh, we don't have a treaty necessarily for related to cybercrime and all the things we just discussed. Those are the list of, in a sense, criteria. And the only treaty one can sort of point to that exists currently is the Convention on Cybercrime. It was drafted in, in 2001. It's called the Budapest because it was signed in Budapest. Uh, it's in force. It exists. It, it, it's being used. It has 51 signatures of accession ratifications currently, 51 states. Those states basically include the United States of America, European Union, Canada is a signatory, uh, South Africa is a signatory, Japan has ratified, the UK just ratified uh, a couple of years ago. We had a ratification from Australia, I think it was last year or, or this year. 
And so it is not regional, so it's not just restricted to Europe, it's not just restricted to Asia, it's not just restricted to Latin America or North America, it is including various regions. And I think most important is who are the members? The members are those who actually have most of the data. That's where the platforms are, that's where the servers are, that's where the evidence is, that's where you want the cooperation from. And therefore that has a use. And the last slide I'll do, and we'll quickly move to the panel, what does it include? It includes, let me first say, all the issues that we mentioned earlier. It is inclusive. It's an open platform. It means that if you join, it doesn't mean that you will not join or you cannot join another treaty. It, doesn't, it, it also is technologically neutral, so it doesn't have uh, uh, offenses like, you know, though it doesn't use the word virus, it talks about misuse of devices. It doesn't use social networking, it talks about illegal access. Things like that. It won't say botnets, it will talk about access to content data, illegal access to content data. And as you can see very quickly from a snapshot, we'll make this available online subsequently, is criminalizing conduct such as illegal access, legal interception, data interference, system interference. And these are basically the, the, the offenses you find in most cybercrime legislations uh, across the world because the, the convention has been a model. It also provides the procedural powers and tools, as you can see in the second box in the middle, uh, the expedited preservation, search and seizure, interception, etc. This is provided in the uh, uh, treaty as well. And then there's the most important element, the third element, which is the international cooperation, which makes it the most useful aspect of the treaty, which is, well, how do we cooperate with each other? And as you can see, uh, it, it allows for other mutual legal assistance treaties to work in conjunction. It doesn't say that I will override any treaty you have. It actually says, if you have a treaty already on this issue, that's the treaty that will work. But if you don't have a treaty, then you can come to me. So it's an inclusive, open, open access platform to be able to cooperate. And the last point you'll see 24-7 points of contact is where you can actually just pick up the phone, know who the person in X country is, make a phone call, and immediately get a response for, so you can ask for assistance, preservation, and other things. And if there are requests for accession, and even beyond that, there have been people who haven't requested for accession, and the Council of Europe has actually assisted them in doing capacity building in those developing countries. Jayanta, myself, um, he'll speak more about this. Uh, he organized a regional workshop in Sri Lanka where India, Pakistan, uh, we had people from Maldives, etc., who also have participated. This is not the first one. It's actually a, a, a series that has actually taken place. So that's just for me, just to set the scene, to sort of start maybe spark a discussion or debate and, and discussion with the panel. Uh, and I'll stop there. Um, and we'll go to our first panelist. Um, uh, so you've heard stuff from researchers or law enforcement, but maybe it's interesting to go and listen to what the private sector may have to say uh, about treaties of this nature. Does it help them? Does it give consistency, etc.? And so our first panelist of the day would be Audrey Honk. She is with the Intel Corporation and uh, has some background in these sort of issues. Audrey, thank you. Take it away. Thanks, Saeed. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you. Good morning. Um, some background in these issues, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to say a few things about the private sector's overall interest in uh, harmonization of specifically criminal statutes and laws across borders, and then talk about why I think it's helpful specifically for developing countries to consider, uh, as they're developing legal frameworks, to consider participation in the Budapest Convention. So first, it, it, just as in, in the regular world or in the kinetic environment, um, criminal behavior is a destabilizing force in society. It's, it's, it's generally a negative thing. It, it creates concern. And so um, the same is true in cyberspace. And so when you look at criminal activity online, it's, um, it's a disincentive for investment and development from a private sector, sector perspective. So the, to the extent that, um, that legal frameworks aren't in place and and criminality online, just as in, in the physical world, isn't addressed, it, it makes an environment unpredictable, unsafe and unpredictable. And those are all factors that the private sector considers when they're looking at um, where to put staff and where to build offices and where to have um, um, technological development take place. And so uh, at, at a very high level, I think it's important to address uh, criminality online in every country up front as, as uh, robustly in legal frameworks as possible because it has, I think, a direct tie to economic development and to growth and prosperity. Uh, and to the extent that we all understand and believe that the internet and um, ICTs are advancing growth at a rate that's much, much greater than maybe uh, we would have anticipated 20 years ago, 
it's really important that the environment that is enabling that growth, advancement of GDP, prosperity, societal values, is uh, a relatively stable and predictable environment. Business likes predictable environments as a, as a general matter. So, um, so I think uh, thinking about how to address criminal um, statutes in the context of the culture and the existing legal frameworks, of course, not everybody, not every country can have a law that looks like everybody else's law, but I think that's why Zayi talks about harmonization as a, and cohesion as the way to address that because what, what you want to have is compatibility so that from a private sector perspective, you can anticipate that uh, a criminal act in one country will be generally treated as a criminal act in another country, and you can expect um, a certain amount of enforcement and action to be taken on the part of the government to uh, both enact and then enforce the laws. And that creates an environment whereby business is incentivized to participate in the economy, to invest more, and the local environment is um, incentivized to take their business online, to use ICTs, to use the internet to advance their own business goals. Uh, and so many, many developing countries have the goal of, of, of trying, to, um, you know, just trying to connect more users and to get more businesses using the internet. And so trust and safety is going to be critical for that advancement to, to connecting the next billion users and the businesses that will rely on ICTs. And, and so, you know, criminal statutes are directly tied to trust. So to the extent that the environment is predictable and people can generally trust the infrastructure to execute their business, they're going to be more likely to take their business online and you're more likely to see growth in a positive direction. Um, and so I think from a, from, a, from a very high level, that's the overall private sector interest in ensuring that um, and in participating in conversations about how to advance uh, cybercrime laws specifically across the globe and to have them as harmonized as possible. Uh, the advantages, I think, you know, I think there's advantages to everybody, develop, developing whoever you are and participating in the Budapest Convention specifically, or at least using it as a foundation in developing um, criminal, criminal statutes with regard to, to crime online. Uh, but I, so I think, and, and sometimes it's hard to kind of envision what does this really look like when you start to break it down to an actual crime. And so um, if you think about a, a normal crime or a crime that you might be more familiar with in the physical world, and you look at, um, say, somebody trying to rob a bank, most crimes are combinations of smaller crimes that are all prosecutable, um, depending on obviously what jurisdiction you're in and all of that. Um, Separately, and, and so they all sort of um, congregate into creating, you know, maybe the ultimate crime that you're that gets reported in the news. But there's lots of little crimes that lead you to that that place. So if you're, you know, if you're robbing a bank, then the person might steal a car. They might illegally carry a firearm. They might brandish the firearm illegally. They might park illegally. They might do a whole bunch of little things that get them eventually into the bank where they steal the money, and that's the part that. Maybe everybody cares about it. The end. <laughs> they did a whole bunch of things to get them there that were also illegal. Uh, and all of the, the the problem that I think Zayid represented well in his presentation is that uh, in the global scale and in the, in the internet, you have a situation where um, it's easy to break up all of those little crimes into different jurisdictions where those crimes may not be either um, there may not be laws against those crimes or they may not be enforced to, if there are laws against those crimes. So when you're robbing a bank, you can't do that. You, you sort of, you're sitting in front of a bank and you're in one jurisdiction and you're usually within not only one country but one state and one county or one, you know, one municipality, whereas on the Internet you, you can break those crimes up, um, carry them across jurisdictions and, and target them to places where, uh, where either the laws are weak or non-existent. And so... Um, the interest, so, so the reason it raises all boats to have the harmonization is to, of laws is to try to create, to, to disincentivize that behavior. And, you know, I don't think eradication of crime is not the goal here. The goal is a manageable environment that's predictable and stable. And if, um, if criminals can anticipate that all of the things that they have to do that are illegal to get to the place where they're committing the crime, stealing the money, um, accessing the data, whatever the, the crime is, uh, is going to be uh, you know, illegal in every jurisdiction that they go look at, then they're going to be much less incentivized, I think, overall to, 
to take that approach to things. And so I think that's why, um, to Zaid's point, regional cooperation is important, but at, at the end of the day, global cooperation is even more important because you can continue to break up the crime into small, small, small parts and, and, and spread it around the world until, um, until everybody has a sort of general accepted level of what is, what is, um, what is uh, anticipated and what is acceptable. So, thank you. Thank you, Audrey. That's fantastic. Thanks a lot. And um, I remember just last week we were in, in, in Seoul talking about cybersecurity, and I believe that Microsoft actually even mentioned that one of the top four issues when they look at you know cooperation or other you know how they how they view a country is whether they've actually signed on to the Budapest Convention as an example. I think that gives you an idea how how private sector sees it as a trust issue if, if you're part of it. So that that's very helpful. I'm going to now move on to uh, someone who's even more of an expert than I am in any of these issues in developing countries, and that's Mr. Janta Fernando. He's from Sri Lanka, uh, set up the ICT authority in Sri Lanka wrote the three different legislations related to cybercrime in that country and has, um, has, been, has, has a lot of experience related to capacity building and also uh, has you know, experience about accession to the Budapest Convention Treaty as well. Thank you. Thank you, Zahid. Uh, thank you for the very kind introduction and, and being in the introduction. I think uh, some people might be wondering that we are part of the mutual education society here, but admiring each other. Uh, so, uh, let me, within this limited uh, period of time, uh, talk a little bit about the legal or legislative option Sri Lanka looked at at the time we started this entire process and how we brought together various options uh, into a common framework uh, resulting in a, a, a legislative instrument that uh, envisages harmonization as an ultimate objective. So, uh, Sri Lanka embarked on a ICT development agenda, which is quite an ambitious ICT development program called the E-Sri Lanka Development uh, Initiative. And that ambitious initiative resulted in a series of reforms the policy and legal arena. So, on the one hand, we had payment systems reforms enabling SMEs and small businesses to be involved in uh, uh, internet based trade and commerce activity, providing a common platform for payment and settlement systems. And of course, that resulted last year in the very first mobile payment license that was issued to uh, uh, international. Uh, international based company in Sri Lanka uh, and, and that really put us uh, up the scale in South Asia in terms of SME uh, uh, facilitation. But with all these evolutions and the developments taking place in the ICT sector, trust and safety, as my friend from Intel pointed out, was a key factor that we wanted to uh, emphasize. And as part of trust and safety, embarked on a legislative journey that started in 1999 and at that time we looked at multiple options available. Uh, we looked at, uh, since we were part of the British Commonwealth of Nations, uh, we were under the British domain for uh, over 100 years until 1948 uh, and many South Asian countries were in similar situations. We looked at the UK Computer Misuse Act of 1990 as an example of a legislative instrument to help us formulate our own law. And I remember as convener of that drafting committee way back in 1999, we embarked on that model and then we had collaboration with the UK government who introduced us to the Commonwealth model law that was available. And all these options were put on the table and we fashioned our law based on those parameters. And then when we went into uh, the provision governing investigation and prosecution. We also had access to what is called the Harare Convention at that time. It is still available. Mutual assistance and cooperation between Commonwealth countries. However, having looked at all these options, we also felt it was necessary to put in a harmonized regime that enables us to go 
one step beyond that framework that or the benchmarks we looked at and looked at and, and, and because we found that a large number of complaints related to Facebook, Twitter, Yahoo, Google, all of them related to cooperation where we had to necessarily engage law enforcement, the US and other parts of Europe and including Japan and Australia. So in that context, we felt what was more prudent to do was to look at a harmonized framework that ensures access to open systems and ensures uh, collaboration with countries even outside of the Commonwealth. So taking all this into consideration, we model our law on the Budapest Cybercrime Convention for the simple reason that it provided a platform for broader harmonization in a global context and it also provided for criminalizing conduct as pointed out in this slide covering broad area of uh, uh, issues that were compatible with the criminal uh, criminalization provisions that were found even in the US, Australia and Japan. And that is a journey we followed and in 2007 the Computer Crimes Act number 24 of 2007 was enacted by Parliament in Sri Lanka. It is based largely on the provisions of the UK Computer Misuse Act. It embodies some of the features of the uh, Harare Convention uh, uh, for mutual legal assistance so much so that in section 35 of the Computer Crimes Act specifically says that the provisions of the Mutual Assistance in Criminal Matters Act, that is the statute that ratified the Harare Convention, will be applicable in respect of providing assistance as between government of Sri Lanka and other states who are either Commonwealth countries specified by the Minister or non-Commonwealth countries specified by the Minister under Section 2 of that particular statute. So, we looked at all these options and what I want to say conclusion is that yes there is all already available uh, models for consideration but we have to go one step beyond that and ensure that we have harmonized provisions that makes our status compatible with Japan, US, uh, other European countries which are not part of the British Commonwealth and provides for a framework for mutual legal assistance and cooperation and that is the reason why we felt it was important to uh, formulate a law based on or contains the features of the Budapest Convention and here we are in a country, a lovely beautiful country, uh, Bali which is part of Indonesia and for the Indonesian delegates I would like to say that Budapest Convention is open for accession even by Indonesia and we had a, uh, at, at, the, at the last octopus conference we had a delegation from Indonesia, they have been uh, proactive. But in this region, in my opinion, uh, Japan and Australia have shown leadership in ratifying the Budapest Convention and we are part of this uh, amazing uh, uh, mutual assistance cooperation group uh, where information is exchanged, legal assistance is, uh, uh, mutual legal assistance is greatly enhanced and our law enforcement is able to collaborate on equal terms with those in the developed world. So in conclusion, Zahid, what I want to say is that Sri Lanka is uh, looking at options of uh, an accession request to the Budapest Convention, the, the capacity building work during the uh, uh, very, very useful workshop we had in Kalampo in collaboration with the Council of Europe uh, a week before last, right, in Colombo, uh, provided a platform for knowledge sharing and more than that, we also found for our, uh, as, as an advantageous tool, the Council of Europe has formulated something called the Electronic Evidence Guide. And that Electronic Evidence Guide was the only instrument that so far known by any international organization to have been produced, which contains a wealth of material whether you are in a civil law jurisdiction or whether you are in a commonwealth, common law jurisdiction. So it's platform neutral, 
legislative neutral, technology neutral, and it provides a useful tool for law enforcement and judges, uh, and, and provides a guide for them to use if they are engaged in the enforcement of cyber crime. So that was another final advantage I thought we should flag that it provides a platform for amazing amount of knowledge sharing and information gathering and not just that dissemination of information. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Yes, you're absolutely right. You know, where, whereas the Commonwealth models are models and they are their schemes like with the RR scheme, the legally binding uh, provision comes from the treaty, etc. And that's why both of these are useful. And, and, and also the Commonwealth is, is consistent with the Buddhist Convention. So following that, as I said, doesn't make any sort of, you know, doesn't mean that you're excluding something. In fact, all of it is very consistent, compatible, and uh, collaborative. Um, it's great to have seen your Chief Justice in Sri Lanka taking such an active role. And one of the things I didn't mention was that the convention actually has specific, uh, specific provisions related to safeguards and human rights. So it, it does do, do more than many other, say, uh, uh, there is no other instrument per se, but it at least provides uh, protections and, and, and asks member states to have uh, civil liberties and human rights protection. There. I will now move to uh, asking um, Bevel, who is from the Caribbean but works uh, with the uh, Packet Clearinghouse, and they've done a lot of work in uh, internet exchange points and work with issues related to cybersecurity, etc., to share his views and thoughts uh, on, on, on treaties related to cyber. Thank you. Thanks, I, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to just, just share a bit of perspective coming out of the, the Caribbean. It's a very diverse region. People think Caribbean, uh, developing states, islands, but it's really not just islands, they're countries. Uh, such as Belize, which is in Central America, Guyana, which is in South America. Um, and it's a very economically diverse region. And I'm saying that because the, the issues being faced uh, as far as cybercrime are concerned uh, are the same as in other regions. And, and this, is, this is a challenge because of the economic constraints. You have um, countries that are both uh, economically but also from a human resource standpoint um, challenged by the the onslaught of um, criminal activity over cyberspace and and the, the the challenge really centers around the fact that uh, the legislative environment in the region is, is still uh, very much a work in progress and so if you consider the, the landscape as a, I think Audrey, Audrey said it well when she uh, referred to the fact that um, environments where laws are weak are attraction points for for cyber criminal activity, and then the region represents a very attractive location. And um, it has already had a history of being a transshipment point for illegal drugs, for example, and um, the history of uh, financial services in a number of territories, such as the uh, British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, and so on, makes um, computerized criminal activity uh, particularly attractive. Uh, for us, what we have seen is that this 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 creates an an interesting set of circumstances for governments in the region to look at the issue of cybercrime. And um, it also creates an incentive for governments or nations outside of the region to look to the Caribbean as a place where if it is not shored up, then it becomes a point of attack for uh, their own economies and their own, um, their own environments. And, and against that backdrop, I, I want to talk about the some of the work that has been taking place within the Caribbean as it relates to cybercrime and, and, uh, and the response to it. Uh, there have been a number of initiatives um, targeted at the region to help strengthen the, the environment and to help boost uh, the, the laws as it pertains to cybercrime. One of them is a, an ITU initiative uh, which is also coordinated by the Caribbean Telecommunications Union called IPCAR, the Harmonization of ICT Policies and Legislation for the Caribbean. Um, the interesting thing about this process is that it is going on, and it's now I think into its second or, or, or third year, it's going on um, while other initiatives surrounding cybercrime are also in process. And I've seen, um, working on the ground in some of these countries, um, cases where one, um, where one activity is completely independent of another. So you have the, the Commonwealth um, Cybercrime Initiative, which has been promoted again through the CTU. Um, in the region looking to support com uh, countries and it's being taken on by departments of government where they don't know that they'll be part of the income process. Uh, this is presenting a serious challenge and, um, and it is it's creating a, a context where there is an acknowledgement that 
uh, treaties are important. There are a number of incidents recently um, that have led to greater profiling of the requirement to, to enter into multilateral agreements. Uh, one of them, for example, a uh, case in Trinidad and Tobago where uh, government officials were implicated in an email, um, um, email threats that represented criminal activity. And to investigate it, they had to turn to Google um, because the emails were all on Yahoo um, and, and Gmail servers, so that's the US-based uh, email service companies. And there was some debate over um, where did the crime take place. And the, the issue, when I look at the, 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 the terms of the Budapest Convention, for example, you can see where a provision is made for these kinds of situations for governments to seek assistance from um, both private sector and other governments. But where there is limited knowledge of the availability of, of channels of cooperation, then um, these things can, can spin off into months and months of unnecessary um, legal action. And so, from a from a, a, a cyber cyber crime coordination standpoint, one of the main issues that we have seen is the issue of education and awareness. What's happening out there? Uh, we have pulled together a program since back in Clearinghouse, uh, also in conjunction with the Caribbean Telecommunications Unit, put together programs to raise awareness of uh, the need for harmonization of legislation, but also for the need to participate in, in wider international forum where um, ministers of government, law enforcement agencies can all understand the, the, the fundamental issues and at the same time bring to, to bear upon local legislative environments the necessary actions that are required. Uh, so, so you do have uh, one, the, the issue of criminalization of, of, of activities. If it is not a crime in the jurisdiction, then it's not a cyber crime. Um, uh, that is one of the, the cases to bring legislative um, action to bear within the region. Uh, harmonization is also another, but I think the issue of coordination of activities and the issue of education remain two of the priority areas uh, that the region is looking at, um, both at the national level but also at the regional level. How does the Caribbean respond to threats that, that pay no respect or regard for um, slowness of legislative updates and pay no regard to limited uh, resources at the level of the policing or national security infrastructure and apparatus. Um, these issues um, basically don't respect borders, they don't respect uh, economic circumstance, and so there is an acknowledgement that action is required, but action cannot be based simply on national timetables. Thank you, Bevel, and, and I'm really glad you mentioned the, the uh, ITU initiatives, for instance, if you you can go to the website, for instance, you'll see in our resources, we have the ITU uh, Guide to Understanding Cybercrime. And in that, you'll see that right in the, fr in the first two pages, it, 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 the entire document is based on the Budapest Convention's definitions. And, uh, you know, things like HIPCAR, et cetera, are extremely helpful because they are, again, fashioned on the basis of the Budapest Convention. But they do give you only national legislation. What they do not give you are necessarily the international cooperation procedures, etc. In order to, as you rightly said, to do coordination and collaboration, you do need to have the Harari scheme of the Commonwealth be part of this whole process and, and also have the Budapest Convention, which is the actual uh, basis on which you, if you join, you will become. And so it's, it's great to see that that sort of progress is taking place on the ground in, in the Caribbean as well, and also in the Asia, you know, the Pacific countries as well, using those models. Uh, I will now turn to our last speaker from the panel, and then we will open it up to questions, and we will hope for interesting debate and questions and comments from the floor. Uh, Anna Nevis, she's with the Portuguese government and is heavily involved in issues related to intergovernance, security, uh, was just in Seoul the other day uh, at the cyber security, uh, the, uh, cyber meeting in Seoul, and, and uh, you know, we we're happy to have her here. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, thank you very much, and the uh, well, um, I have only four points uh, to uh, raise here today after all, all this very good uh, ex explanation that I don't think that uh, I don't have anything uh, interesting to add except uh, uh, an, an overview of someone that is from a government uh, in, uh, in Europe. My first point is that it will be very interesting to, to hear the reaction of the audience um, on what uh, has, has been said here and what uh, are your views on, on this issue. 
um, because the importance of international cooperation here is self-explanatory. If you don't have uh, harmonized procedures with, with the world, how can you solve a national cyber crime? Uh, it is not going to stop as it comes from here. Uh, my third point is that it makes no sense for a new specific treaty for developing countries. This is an area uh, where all countries worldwide have to share information for procedures, mechanisms, etc. And uh, finally, in my, uh, my fourth point is uh, that the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime is a very important tool to be used, but there is no single solution for the accession of all developing countries. Uh, the negotiation should be made on a Thank you, Anna. It's, it's great to have the perspective of, of a European country also who is a member of the uh, uh, Council of Europe Convention, etc. Thank you for your support of that. Um, what I'd like to uh, now do is um, open up the, uh, uh, to the floor. Uh, please, um, if you have questions or comments or things you'd like clarifications on or any question you want to address to any of the panelists, feel free to do so. There is a mic, hopefully, that's going around. Uh, I think Zara. Uh, we'll be getting that mic across to you. Please, you know, just raise your hands and we'll pull you in. Please, you have a mic. Go ahead. Thank you. And, and if, uh, for the transcribers, it would be great to get your name and your, your affiliation. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Sita Dewi. I'm from uh, Cyber Law Center from the University of Pajajaran. Uh, I'd like to know more uh, about how Pakistan and Sri Lanka practice inside the time uh, legislation relating to the uh, online defamation because Indonesia has several cases on online defamation and how you balancing between the uh, cyber uh, subject crime uh, defamation and the human rights. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take the first since you mentioned Pakistan. I'm happy to address that and then in terms of you in China, that would be helpful. Um, so we had an extensive process in Pakistan where initially, and this is happening in many places, where although the Budapest Convention was slightly being followed, there was a lot of interesting things that were included uh, where they just simply had a provision of cyber stalking that related to uh, anything that is immoral, that is sent through ele electronic communication, there was no definition of what immoral means, so really it depends on whatever, who thinks what's immoral was becoming a cyber crime and it could have a seven year sentence. Um, there was a huge amount of advocacy uh, uh, from civil society, from business also, and, and from, from uh, parliamentarians within our, our parliament in Pakistan rejecting that draft bill. Uh, and, and it was rejected by parliament. It, it even came to the vote and there was a big fight and it was rejected. The prime minister sent it back to a select committee. And now we have a different legislation which actually doesn't have such open-ended definitions. And what we've realized is that cybercrime doesn't mean that a cyber... Because these days, anything in life is related to IT or cyber. Now, are you going to take your entire penal code and say that we need to revamp the entire penal code and include it into a cybercrime legislation that I think becomes very challenging and difficult and probably is not the solution. But a cybercrime legislation, from our perspective, deals with those provisions that would not be triable, for instance, it wouldn't be offenses if you didn't, and they're specific to the technology of cyber. So that's where we concentrate on. That's why the Budapest Convention and the model laws help, because they identify those particular ones, and so you don't have to fight about the rest of the, the aspects. On Specifically on defamation, one of the things we've done is we have a 2002 ordinance, uh, or defamation ordinance, that actually simply takes a defamation law and says whether this is done to broadcast, electronic means, communication, it, that same def defamation legislation uh, or law would apply even if it was electronic. But we did not do it as part of the cyber crime uh, legislation because we did it separately. And I think that's helpful because sometimes what happens is when anybody comes to the party on trying to draft a cyber crime legislation, they want to just include anything and everything in there. And I think it's very important to, to, to be aware that one, that's just not going to be possible. Two, it doesn't make sense in the cyber, uh, how you define many other things. And third, imagine the sort of administrative issues you would have. So it's helpful to put it in and stream mainstream these sort of things into your, into your, into your penal code and, and through those. So that's how we dealt with defamation online. We have a separate legislation that deals with that. Uh, so I'll let you have that. 
Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for that question. And it is indeed a very, very interesting issue. Uh, let me give the Sri Lankan and uh, somewhat similar South Asian perspective to this whole thing. Defamation, the question I would put back to you is if there's a defamatory material online, is it punishable as a criminal law offence or will you be liable for penalties or damages in what is called a civil law suit? And the legislative route that you can take to address this question depends on that on, 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 on those two options. So talking of the Sri Lankan perspective, some time ago until 2003 we had a provision in the uh, criminal code criminalizing defamation. But due to the advocacy of the Article 19 Working Group in Sri Lanka and the Free Media Movement and the Press Complaints Commission and many other people, and due to the misuse of this provision sometimes by various authorities, criminal defamation was abolished. So now what we have is remedies available under civil law, namely uh, action for damages that can be filed for defamatory uh, uh, publication. So how our courts have looked at this is, is, is the following. We have our co common law principles governing defamation and the courts have been fairly flexible in making use of the, the definition called publication. So the definition of publication has been extended to mean online electronic publications as well. But in terms of serving notices, in terms of filing a case, if the def defamatory publication is in Sri Lanka, no problem. If it is in some part of the Commonwealth, again then we can refer to some of the mutual legal assistance provisions, but there again the issue is we cannot extend the notice provisions or court notices to US or other parts of the world where the server is located, where the defamatory material is found. So this is where I come to a slightly different subject, the role and the very important task that any country's national or independent search compute emergency response teams have in addressing this whole issue. In Sri Lanka we have a situation where roughly every month there are over 200 Facebook defacements and abuse cases and abuse cases or defamatory activity arising from uh, Twitter and so on and so forth. So how we have dealt with that issue is without pursuing a legal course that will take a long period of time especially in the case of a defamatory publication. Our national assert, which became part of the global first community way back in 2007, has been able to work collaboratively with other certs and with Facebook and Twitter and many other organizations to take down abusive sites and sites which contain harmful material. But there again, I want to emphasize that Facebook, Twitter, Google, Yahoo, all of them, they look into a country to see what treaties, what rules and norms that particular country has adopted. And there again, I come back to the advantage of the Budapest Convention because if you have acceded or made an accession request to the Budapest Convention or ratified it as a, as a treaty obligation, then resolving 
those issues become extremely difficult, extremely simple. Why? Because if you look at Facebook policies, uh, Google policies, Yahoo policies, and even those servers which are hosted in Australia, Japan, South Korea, those policies have a mechanism where they say somewhere that if that country or a requesting country has signed up to an international best practice treaty, then their assistance is faster, quicker, and more responsive. Thank you. Thank you, Jamta. Um, I also wanted to say defacement basically is an illegal access. So if somebody defaces your Facebook, it's an illegal access. Post a picture which is being corrupted, that's the intellectual property uh, offense because they've taken a picture and they've messed with it. And if there's a defacement, that can be illegal access as well. So there, there are other ways you can get around it. And, and for that purpose, you can get cooperation. Sometimes when you make a request saying defamation, people may not necessarily cooperate. But if you frame the question or the charge correctly, you may get more cooperation. I am conscious that we have two remote participants asking questions, but I'll come to them in a second. We have one. I will recognize the gentleman here in the, in the red shirt. Then I think we'll go to the next one. You, sir, are the third and fourth there on the left. And I think the lady also raised her hand. I'll try to remember the queue if you don't help me, please. Please, sir, go ahead. Okay, you talked a uh, lot in Vendid of the Council of Europe Treaty, probably. And also, some developing countries like Iran and South Africa are complaining that developing countries do not have enough voice internationally to set up all those, uh, I mean, treaty. And also, some countries like uh, China, Russia, and the uh, and the Shanghai Cooperation Economies, their complaint is that these treaties are built in the first advantage and they, they advantage of Western countries and they basically are arguing that we should build more information security rather than cyber security and I was wondering what is your, what is your view on this one and probably related to that is uh, this harmonization thing might be very, very difficult to achieve actually. I don't know if you can do harmonization in five years or ten years. And a lot of other areas, uh, they are developing this informal network, international network, and uh, those type of informal type of cooperation. And so if you know any engagement in that type of cooperation from your country, rather than working on the treaty, which is not easy to achieve probably. Thank you. Uh, if you. Just for the transcribers, would you give your name and... Uh, my name is Neil Chetri. Uh, from where, sir? I'm, uni I'm from University of North Carolina. So nice to meet you, sir. Uh, I think the important points you raised, I think it's useful for this audience. I'll just take them step by step, and I, if anyone else on the panel wants to raise their hand, and, and please do that. Uh, first of all, the, 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 the challenge with, and I think informal mechanisms of cooperation are extremely important. It's useful. But they only can go to the step where they give you the intelligence or the information. Those informal channels cannot provide you evidence that you can take to court because when you get that information, you cannot use that in a court, therefore you cannot prosecute. So that's one of the first problems uh, or limitations, if you will, with respect to uh, an informal network. It's very useful as an intelligence gathering tool to tell you what to do, but it cannot give you the tools you need to do an actual cyber crime uh, prosecution and take the criminals to court. That's one. Second. Um, I think you mentioned the harmonization, I agree with you, but I think what, what I've seen generally is everybody, wherever, whatever model law we look at, it's interesting. Even the ITU uh, guide will show you, this is on the website for us if you go have a look at it. You'll see that all the basic provisions of illegal access, uh, you know, uh, uh, information systems, etc., these definitions are all generally the same. So harmonization to a large extent is taking place already by following these models. Because it's very difficult to come up with your own new definition which doesn't make sense. So most drafters are following this. So that harmonization is taking place, number one, on its own. Second, I think that harmonization has to take place if you're really going to cooperate. Otherwise, how would you be able to address the crimes? And it's not that you try to actually address, as I said, everything. The, the, it, the, the convention has for about five or six or seven, I think, different provisions that you need to criminalize. It. At least if you can get those you have a basis to start cooperating. If other countries want to build on that, add other things to it, maybe Indonesia, as we heard, wants to make a you know, criminal offense out of defamation, there's no stopping that. They can do that in their own country. But the baseline set of at least having the minimal standard is what the, what the as it's an open platform, that's what the convention provides. I want to address the more important question of there is this myth that the uh, convention actually is to the advantage of uh, developed countries. And I want to address that. Uh, we, then this is a longer discussion. I'm happy to take this offline as well. But let me just uh, suggest this, the following to you. The convention enables cooperation between countries. As a developing country, 
the fact that basically I would become a member, or my country would become a member, and I'm Sri Lanka's thinking of acceding to the Budapest Convention. Imagine who is going to be making most of the requests. I don't think it will be the United States of America making most of the requests to Pakistan or maybe Sri Lanka. I think most of the requests will be going the other way, where the developing countries are asking for assistance from the developed countries because the servers and the data is actually there. So one of the things which I find very interesting is it's never really been played up because the focus has never been on this issue, is actually at the end of the day, the convention really helps the smaller developing countries, the ones who are the requesters of, of, of assistance to actually be the ones who are at advantage as a result. I don't otherwise see any other, unless you can specify specific advantage that a, you know, a developed country has over a developing country. But I would say that it's the other way around. And that would be my response. Janetha, do you want to add or anybody else would like to add? I think Audrey uh, wants to go next. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think just one thing in reaction to the question of, you know, what is the, you know, who is the convention intended for? You know, I, I agree with Saeed that the, the basic goal here is to get those seven or eight or ten or however many things they are, um, criminal acts, uh, yeah, internationally criminalized. Thank you. Yes, and, and the goal. I mean, I so I think it's you know there's been a lot of rhetoric around, um, you know, whether this was intended only for Europe or whether it was intended only for the West. And I, I think we should try to set aside the rhetoric and talk about how to get the substance dealt with because the rhetoric distracts us distracts us away from making progress on the real issues and. Uh, I, so I think the intent is not to disadvantage anyone or to be more favorable to one type of law versus another type of law, um, but the intent is to try to uh, articulate criminal acts that should be unambiguously criminal for pretty much everybody. And so, um, and, and, you know, so I encourage, and to today's point, no matter what, what model law we're looking at, if we can get those things, you know, if we have a, a baseline to start with, then cooperation the one thing I meant to say earlier that I didn't say is that I think in the larger context of trust and security and stability in cyberspace that one of the most important ways to build that trust among countries over time uh, is to build um, cooperation and that's sort of self-evident. It's easy to say that and hard to do. But the most actionable way to do that is cooperation on um, prosecution of cybercrime. It's an area that's a little bit less politically charged than some other areas. It's an area where people can often cooperate easier. And so it's a really important place to start the conversation among the global community if we're going to continue to make progress on, I think, broader sort of cyberspace and security and, and privacy issues generally. And, and so, there, but there has to be a mechanism to have that cooperation. And so, you know, whether it's, it's Budapest and Budapest just happened to be there first, and it happened to be, um, you know, it happens to be sort of globally recognized. Or whether it's it's a different model, I'm not sure. At the end of the day, we should care too much. We should care that the outcome is uh, is that we're reducing criminal activity online and that we're making the environment more stable for business and consumers to use. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, I just wanted to say, share with you, and I mean, it just occurred to me now. Do you know who the most uh, excited person? sense, stakeholder in my country is about the Budapest Convention. They actually brought it to a meeting when we were, do, we were drafting the legislation, was both law enforcement and intelligence saying, this is what we need to go out and read the information. And it was, it was them. And, and, and the politics is where the foreign office, so that's the politics of the, you know, we're all getting involved. In, and I think, I think the developing countries are becoming victims of this politics of global, you know, you know d dimensions or whatever you want to call it, uh, the paradigms. But actually on the ground. You know, we need cooperation. We need to be able to sign up to this so that we can actually get assistance. Uh, Jantha has a point. What I want to do now quickly is, uh, after Jantha speaks, take short questions and come back and maybe the panelists and all of us will try to actually be limited in our time because we also have moder uh, remote moderation. Thank you. Um, just a quick reaction to your question. In fact, the concerns and the uh, problems you raised are very well known and really well appreciated. And that is the reason why we need to have a wider dialogue and discussion about those issues. But having said that, we can have technical collaboration or we can have 
technical collaboration or both. So in the area of technical collaboration between countries, the CERT model is a good example and that is where we have very unique collaborative activity in the Asia Pacific region with Japan, Philippines, Australia and now even with China and India. So it's working really well and that technical collaboration will address part of the problem. But if you are to address the legal issues, mutual legal assistance and uh, trying victims or, or trying offenders in each of our different countries uh, by recourse to mutual legal assistance, then we have to have a legal instrument. So either we can make use of an existing framework or make and just wait and idle around for 10 15 years before an international legal instrument comes. So the choice is yours. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. There's a glass which has water in it, and then there's a glass which is empty, and it's up to you to choose in a sense. I, what I would like to do is, without uh, having the panelists respond, take three or four questions very quickly. Sir, I think you were next, right? Please. Thank you. My name is Walter Nazvis. I think it's easy to say that I'm representing the London Action Plan and the Expand Community today and tomorrow or something else. Um, I think I wanted to give an example, but I think we're running out of time. So what I would like to do is to say that at 16.30 tomorrow afternoon, we're going to have some excellent examples of best practices on cooperation uh, internationally and nationally in a forum which is strangely enough called the Dutch Economic Ministries Open Forum and it doesn't say anything but it's on international and national cooperation examples and I think that will really help people here in the room that could uh, learn from that and see some examples. Um, I'm going to skip the, 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 the example I have but what I think is important how do we basically teach civil servants and governments and, and, and their bosses the ministers that it's really necessary to to take down these national border barriers in the international cooperation. Because the, the example I had is basically skip everything. You do something for one country in another country, then the judge says, well, it's a board, so it's no offense in this country, and somebody else does it from the country to your country, and then said, you're, you're not allowed to do anything because it's done it in abroad. If that is the case in cybercrime, and the judge does it in the highest ruling possible, it means you're completely tied unless somebody's doing it in your own country. So that's happened in the Netherlands, in the Nowhere case. In other words, how do you do capacity building to the judges that they understand that maybe they did this wrong, solved this wrong, and on the other hand, how do you get government officials that it's really necessary to tear down a little bit of these barriers? Thank you, that's right. And the convention helps with judicial as well. It has a judicial guide as well. Um, who was, I think there was a gentleman here uh, that was first. Is that right? Uh, I think you were first, I think, sir. Can we go to you, come back to you, sir, afterwards? Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Well, from the speaker. Uh, we've and if you could give your name and your designation, uh, your okay. affiliation. I'm Joshua from the Ministry of uh, Communication and Promotion Technology in Indonesia. So from the speaker, we've noticed that there have been some regional instruments established to combat cybercrime. Like you said, European Convention, also uh, the Caribbean, Arab, African, Shanghai, and so on and so forth. So each of the instruments needs strong commitment from its region to participate, like uh, accession or also ratification. And each of the instruments has its own standards, for sure. So if in one regional which has regional instruments, all countries in the regional join the regional instruments and other countries in all regions do the same thing. What would you think? I think it would be not effective. It means that we will come in the saturation point where all the uh, regional have to push their standards. And in that term, the each regional has to bridge from one region to another region for example, EU region to the Arab EU region, to the uh, Shanghai EU region, to the Caribbean, and so on and so forth. So, um, I think maybe this is the problems that we will face in the future, and maybe it's time for developing countries to see the view on having international standards. So, um, how do you think about that? I think it's a good point, and I, I do want to address it. I know I, know I promised we wouldn't 
but I very quickly want to say that's, that's, that's exactly the reason why the Budapest Convention offers the open platform because just because you join that doesn't mean that it is inconsistent or contradicts the other ones you mentioned. Uh, on, on the merits of the other uh, uh, regions, I think it's, it's a great thing that those, those regions are working on trying to have collaboration amongst themselves. Anything that can happen internationally to try to get cooperation side of is a good thing. But here's the thing. They don't necessarily have the international cooperation provisions in any of the treaties that you mentioned, by the way. They're not mutual legal assistance treaties. They just have principles, and that's pretty much it. But it's a good thing that they're doing it. The only convention that provides that is the Budapest Convention, which is across regions. And again, if you join that, doesn't mean you can't. So the question of, is it going to be inconsistent and will it split the world? No, not at all. It's an open platform, open source, come and join. doesn't stop you from doing anything else that you want to do in your country or with other countries. The, uh, there was a gentleman on the right here, I think you wanted to sort of add as well. So please. My name is Habibullah uh, Allah from Sudan. So I have to talk about uh, the crime. The most, most, most crime, or the crime is the crime against children. Uh, is from my question to all uh, uh, is how do you think about uh, this and how we take in consideration seriously the protection of children from the dangerous of the internet because the most important crime is the crime against children because children is our future if you have a good children today you have a good uh, leader tomorrow how did you think about this and your opinions and experience Thank you. Actually, uh, what I'm quickly responding to, the convention has a specific provision on child pornography and protection of children. But we'll come back and I'll have the panel actually address every uh, the, the point. I think it's a very important point. That's one thing everybody agrees on, and that's why the convention provides a baseline. We have the lady on the left here who would like to go next. Good morning. My name is Patricia Vargas. I'm a PhD candidate in Kitsap University. Uh, in concrete, uh, you mentioned that 51 states either sign or ratify the convention and therefore the convention is enforced. So, thinking specifically about developing countries that decided not to join or they did not ratify or sign the convention, yes. what are the main reasons why they decided not to do it? I'm, I'm, I'm familiar just with Latin America, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, but the, the belief in there is that the main reason why they, they are, are reluctant to sign the convention is because they say it can affect some human rights. For instance, they are thinking that it will end with the online and I mean, you can tell me if that's correct or no, but uh, I would like to know more about the concrete reasons why they think that it's not Thank you. We'll definitely take that. That's an extremely important question. Human rights, Article 15 of the Convention, and we want to deal with it. We have, uh, who is next, I think? There was, I think you'd raise your hand, sir, if you'd like to do that. And then we'll go to the two remote participants and then come back to the panel with the collection of these points and see what, what responses we have, sir. Just adding on to, to that point, there's... Your name and affiliation oh, sorry, the uh, My name is Pranish Prakash. Uh, I'm a policy director at the Center for Internet and Society and I'm a access knowledge fellow at the Yale ISB. Um, well, following on from that point, uh, there are provisions in the Budapest Convention that allow authorities to force uh, uh, ISPs and, and, and uh, DNS providers, etc., to implement measures uh, for data retention. Now, uh, I'm wondering how all of this would play, for instance, with, uh, with uh, what IETF is now thinking about with HTTP2, where SSL becomes, where encryption becomes required. How do these kinds of provisions about forcing uh, actually end, end up working with those? And secondly, uh, how does, uh, so copyright is, is there in Article 10 of the Convention. Copyright is put on the same pedestal as child pornography. Okay, that both will have to be equally implemented. Now, that will, uh, will have requests, many more requests coming in from the US and UK and European countries towards developing countries than the other way around. So I'm not sure I agree with you uh, on the point that it'll only that, that the traffic, most of the requests will be one-way traffic. Uh, and, and what happens to the concept of data havens uh, under this? So what happens to, for instance, a country like Iceland that is trying to have a very high set of, uh, of, of standards for free speech, for privacy, etc., and saying, store data here? Thank you. Um, 
what, what I'll just say because I know that sometimes you lose threads. Uh, first of all, this is the greatest myth that the Budapest Convention actually requires data retention. There is absolutely no provision related to data retention in that convention. I'm glad you asked that question because this is a very um, publicized myth. There's no provision related to that. There is a provision of preservation, and if you can show me a retention one, I'd be happy to look at it. We know it quite well. And this is something we've been dealing with constantly. There's such a lot of publicity about what is in there sometimes becomes a problem, but we'll deal with that in detail. So I, also, I was talking yeah. about preservation article 16. Oh, preservation. Preservation means it's the same as any other situation where effectively if the law enforcement gets to know that there's been a crime, they go and they freeze whatever data exists as of that moment, not retention that you just have to actively like People might say the NSA collecting data. That is not something that is part of the Budapest Convention. It's important to make that distinction. It does not make any law enforcement or country start retaining citizens' data. It does not happen. It does not part of the, uh, the, the convention. On Article 10, I'll come back to that because most countries are already members of the WTO trips anyway and the, and the Paris Convention, so I don't think that's a problem, but we'll come back to that in a second. Two questions from remote participants. Kusum, if you could uh, run them through, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, we actually have a question from one of the remote participants. Her name is Karen. She's from Malaysia. Two are directed to Zahid and one is a general comment for all the panelists. Her first question is, um, you mentioned earlier in your slides, whether um, is data preservation referring to data retention? Yeah. And the second question is, is the proposal to develop a new treaty on cybercrime? If that is the case, would it be managed by UN like the other international treaties? Would it not be easier for developing countries to ratify the existing international convention what 51 countries have already ratified? And um, we have lost uh, the second. chat. Um, there was a, a general comment, which is, um, in your experience, when a cyber crime is committed across jurisdictions, assuming that there is a legal treaty for cooperation, how is the investigation managed? Would it be generally managed by country that first raised the issue, i.e., where the victim resides, for example? Thank you. Thank you. I think what just, we would have... Sorry, just yes. one clarification. Yeah. In addition to Article 16, I was also referring to Articles uh, 20 and 21 uh, while talking about ret data retention. So no, no, they don't, they don't say retention. So look at it again. Okay. They talk about they explain they why they don't. Because so they talk about real-time collection of computer data, right. which could be future... Uh, a right. thing that collect data relating to, uh, and let me just read out, traffic data in real time associated with civic communication since territory transmitted by means of a computer system, and uh, they have to, uh, com they, they're allowed to compel a service provider to collect or record through application of technical means on the territory of that party, etc., etc. Correct. So, so the way that works, just to clarify, and, and this is why I think what, 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 what our center is trying to do in developing countries is give clarification as to what this means. And uh, so let me address that. And I think that's a great thing. If people here want to discuss these provisions offline, we'll be really glad to help you with that as well. But let me address that. What it's talking about, first of all, is this traffic data, which is logs and information of logs. That's number one. So that's not your content recording of conversations. So I don't know. So hold on. So that's one. Second, when it's real-time collection of judge general data, the way that works is that there has to be, usually in most countries, a warrant by a judge authorizing that there's an investigation going on from that point, in fact, targeted at a single individual, not basically the sort of thing that we all think is happening, which is, you know, you, you collect data generally, which, in, if, you, if you come from India, I don't know, I, I, I come from Pakistan, our intelligence agencies do it all day. But they're intelligence agencies, not law enforcement. So that's not what is required. That it's not, it's not collection on an ongoing basis of everybody. It is in a particular, it's like a wire tap that you have on a phone conversation of an individual targeted for a particular period and safeguarded by judicial oversight because Article 15, which I wasn't able to mention earlier, Article 15 of the Convention, if you read, requires, and you read that, judicial and independent supervision of the procedural powers that have been used. So you can't have a law enforcement official go, okay, I think I'm going to target about 25 people today and it's go ahead and start recording the data or ask an ISP to do that. So that article doesn't do that, but we can, we can give you even further information about how that would be implemented and where it is a requirement that the civil liberty safeguards of that in, in that convention have to be safeguarded. As an example, the Commonwealth Model Law, 
that is that is being implemented, or even the HIPCAR one that you mentioned, require that these powers, and this is where it addresses the question you asked, have to be uh, 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 enabled by a judge's uh, before a court, an independent court of law, and it's and it's again targeted at an individual, not not on a system. Let me uh, then go to the panel to respond to the various questions, etc., that we've heard. Audrey, would you like to go uh, first? Uh, sure. I think just to pick up on that thread. I mean, I think the other thing that's important to remember about the convention is that it, it it's broad in the way that it talks about inter, you know interception, real time interception, and um, data at rest or you know stored data. Uh, it, in that it requires that there be some capability, some legal instrument in a jurisdiction that when there's an ongoing investigation that you can, um, for the purposes of that investigation, get access to that. It doesn't necessarily tell the jurisdiction how what the legal instrument has to be, how they have to implement it, what it has to look like in the law, but as a practical matter, there has to be some way to conduct the investigation just like any other criminal matter. So it provides the flexibility for each country to develop the legal instruments in the way that best fits within their existing legal frameworks while also trying to set a level of harmonization so that, you know, if there is a, a, a criminal action going and you need to be able to get access to data, that there's some understanding that there can be cooperation in that. Now, and I think that the questions that you raise about, um, or that you imply perhaps about um, privacy and surveillance and, and are, you know, I think they're, they're difficult and they're, they are less harmonized, perhaps, across jurisdictions, which makes it a challenging conversation. But I think one way uh, to have a conversation in the future is about, uh, to Zaid's point, um, not just to have the, the provisions that are there about judicial oversight, but or judicial warrants, but also to have a conversation about oversight and accountability in the process of um, implementing this over time, and so that you know you there's inherently some need to be able to get access to data. I think that generally people accept that. What I think they don't accept is the idea that that goes unchecked and unmonitored, and if that's done in an untransparent way by government, then you lose trust. So the question is, within every jurisdiction, how do you build that transparency and accountability within the government so that, um, so that you know, the lines between criminal and, and non-criminal actions are much more um, clear and helpful? Um, with regard to your question about human rights, um, I think that, again, it's sort of the same response in some ways in, in the sense that this doesn't, I mean, first of all, it has the protections for human rights and recognizes um, the existing uh, mechanisms and um, Convention on Human Rights and everything here at Article 15. I also think it's important that to, to reemphasize that this is trying to be culturally neutral and it's important that um, that we have as many culturally sort of neutral mechanisms as possible because so many of these sensitive issues are very contextual to a legal environment or a culture of what's private to you isn't private to me, it isn't private to our colleagues here in Indonesia. And so, you know, it's trying to set a high level goal. And I think if we get to a place where we say, oh, we can't set goals because we're all too different, then we really run ourselves into trouble in terms of being able to maintain interconnectedness. So we need to be able to say, you know, we have the goal of this, and you can go implement it in a way that makes sense for your human rights obligations in your culture and under your privacy laws, and we can go implement it in a way that makes sense under our culture and our privacy laws and our security laws, whatever they may be, but still achieving that same goal. And so I think that's at least I think that's the intent, and we've seen it work in some places. The other thing about the – somebody asked a question about number of signatories and things, and I don't work for the Council of Europe. I never have. I can't represent them at all, but um, they were in Budapest. Oh, they were in Seoul. <laughs> Not in Budapest last week. We were in Seoul last week. And in Seoul, and uh, Alexander Seeger, I think, unless he's here, which I assume he'd be on this panel if he were here, but he's not here. You know, he made reference to the number of countries who, while they may not have signed and ratified the treaty, are using it as a basis for developing their legal framework. And I think that's, and I can't remember what the number was, so I apologize, but it was large. I think it was over 100. And I think that's encouraging in the sense that even if they aren't signing, I mean, it took the, it took the UK like a really long time to rat ratifying treaties is, is a non-trivial issue among countries, right? It took the US like, I don't know, a long time, five, six years to, it didn't take them long to sign it, it took them a long time to ratify it just as a result of 
procedural political issues, but but I think that the, um, it's encouraging to see that even if countries aren't able to sign or ratify, they're still using it as a foundation, which will help us drive toward harmonization. Thank you, Audrey. What we'll do is, uh, uh, this is why this workshop is, is basically a starter. Hopefully the next IGF what we plan to do is actually have a, uh, a, a clarifying exercise, a myth-busting exercise. Take many of the things that you've actually said, bring it next time, please do come to the next workshop so we can actually take each and every one of these points and, and drill down. And that's the whole purpose of the center. Try to help you understand what the limits of this are. And, you know, that's up to you to decide whether it makes sense for a particular country or not. On the issue of uh, the, the IPR, uh, the Convention on Article 10 basically simply says that uh, members of the Convention have to comply with their existing responsibilities under the TRIPS and Paris Conventions. It only said that if you are a signatory, you would comply with them. So if you are a signatory to the Paris Convention, you already are bound to comply with it. And I think Jantha is going to talk about how that's implemented also in a country with safeguards. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I think uh, the lady from Turkey, oh, uh, the lady over there from, from Latin America and my friend from India, I think you raised two very valid points and those were the concerns and issues that we had to address in Sri Lanka during 2006 and 2007 when our Computer Crimes Act was finalized and presented before the Parliamentary uh, Review Committee and how we addressed it was the following basically in the interest of time. Uh, number one, uh, we understood that the intellectual property obligations imposed was uh, simply a commitment to ex extend the existing treaty obligations both under the Paris and the TRIPS Convention. And as far as intellectual property law is concerned, it, even if a request comes from another country, making use of the, uh, the, the uh, legal assistance provisions here, they have to subscribe to the legal requirements in our own country. Why? Because intellectual property is territorial. It's a private law remedy. So that is how we address the issue and we have put in our own safeguards while being consistent with the Budapest Convention. We have put in our safeguards to ensure that our courts will have the jurisdictional authority to address them. Then the issue of human rights, and, and I think this was an issue that was slightly blown out of proportion in our, in our view. Uh, the issue was whether uh, this drafting a law consistent with this uh, Budapest Convention will impose the same standards, human rights standards of Europe. But when we studied, we found in respect of all of the provisions concerning preservation of uh, data, subscriber, uh, information or uh, subscriber uh, traffic data and subscribe information. All that was required was to ensure checks and balances that there was no open ended mechanism for law enforcement to continue to track information or access subscriber data or traffic data. What we have done in our law was to include the same safeguards and those are the human rights safeguards that they are talking about, nothing else. Safeguards to codes of law. So in our law in section 18 of the Computer Crimes Act 24 2007 available uh, uh, by doing a uh, on the website uh, doing a Google search or anything or even on this website here, you will see that the magistrate's intervention, court intervention is mandatorily required if preservation is of data is needed beyond a prescribed period. That is how we have it. And I just wanted to sort of take a moment and say that um, um, I think this is why the myth-busting exercise is very helpful. And one of the things we'd like to do is basically take time and sort of address one of these things step by step. So if you have any questions, feel free to come and contact us on the website. We will provide you with clarifications. And in addition to that, please do watch out for the uh, sort of capacity building exercise we'll have next time around, which are going to take some of these um, um, criticisms and try to say, well, how does a developing country handle this one? Whether, whether it, how it should implement it. One of the interesting points made um, uh, by uh, the, one of the remote participants was that should we keep waiting for something else when there is nothing, or should we, I mean, and if there is an attempt to try and have something else, it'll probably take 10, 15, 20 years, maybe longer. Uh, this discussion of whether there should be maybe a new treaty has been going on for now at least 10 years. We've lost a lot of time. 
and uh, you know so we can keep waiting for this thing that will never ever arrive or basically uh, well, we, we will not probably get consensus on it and there's no proposal currently that is accepted in the UN for a treaty there just isn't it was actually voted down so there's no process at the moment on that there's only one agreement capacity building that's the agreement only the only agreement you have so in the meantime there is a treaty 51 people or member states have actually signed on to it which are actually the large ones where the data is held and so the question then arises is does it suit your own national interest to be able to get cooperation or it doesn't because the way we looked at it in our, in our country was in our country is I don't care about the international global politics of being pulled in one direction by one force or being pulled in another direction by another force I'm interested in my sovereign vested interest of my own national, you know, my nation and my country. Does this help me get cooperation? Does it help me get cybercrime cooperation and data which I'm otherwise not able to get? And that, I think, is the main issue. Get away from the politics and look at the merits and see whether that makes any sense. We are way out of time. What I'm surprised is nobody's come and said you need to leave. So <laughs> we're about 10 minutes uh, into the... Oh, there's one other point. We'll take that and uh, then we'll, I think, close. Go ahead. And, and there's, I'm so sorry, there, the two... and. And uh, let's go to you first. You had actually raised your hand, and then we'll sort of close the panel, please. Go ahead, thanks. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, go ahead. Thank you, I'm Eduardo Bartoni. I'm a law professor at Palermo University in Buenos Aires. And let me tell you, I'm teaching two courses. One is human rights on the internet, and the other is cyber. Uh, and I, usually, the students make tough questions. So I want to pass you one of the tougher questions that sure. I have. Uh, in my cybercrime uh, course, uh, when one of my last classes is about international standards, and of course I gave the students the Budapest Convention, and after studying and reading and analyzing the, the Budapest Convention, they asked me, Eduardo, why us as a country should support this convention that was drafted more than 10 years ago? Good question than uh, the wording, the te technology more than 10 years ago was dramatically different, that the wording is creating what you are calling the myth, because I think that the, what you call the myth is the interpretation of the wording that probably is, 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 is outdated. And why should we should follow and support this convention that right. was drafted? 10 years ago, right. and we were not participating. Correct. That, that. Uh, one is the age, and second is participation. Uh, let me address that quickly. I, I, I apologize. And you made the plug, and we'll, hopefully at 4 o'clock we'll get to see your. Well, go ahead, then I'll respond to this pretty quickly, because I think they're waiting outside, we just realized. Yeah. Okay, my name is Walter Nasris. Um, what I think that happened in your country is that somebody made himself responsible for this topic and then start driving and trying to find uh, right. people who, that will actually listen to you. Right. So is, is it what that is about, finding the right person in the country that makes himself responsible for this topic? Thank you. I think that's, that's an ex excellent point. I think finding champions. Let me respond very quickly to the point that you made. Number one, uh, you know that Australia ratified it last year or this year, I think, and, and Britain ratified this convention last year. And they are probably the most uh, uh, advanced in, in basically trying to be ahead with the times. The reason why the reason why the, the, the definitions do not uh, uh, become archaic, and I'll explain. If you if you'd seen the presentation, let, let me explain. So, if you'd seen the presentation that I've given, I think you came in a little later. You will find that basically the way that the definitions have been done are technologically neutral, so they don't define any specific technology. So it, it's 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 not it's not hacking, but illegal access. It's not botnets but basically uh, interference with the system. It's not VoIP, it's, as the gentleman said, collection of data. And that's why these countries are still signed on to it, number one. Number two, what about participation? One of the things you'll recall that in most of the countries, even in Latin America and in India, Pakistan, South Asia, we signed on to conventions that we didn't negotiate when it came to aviation, when it came to uh, logistics, maritime, um, uh, uh, a whole bunch of different ones. It's only the recent conventions, I guess, we were party to. Russia and China signed on. They weren't part of the WTO. They didn't negotiate it, but they came in afterwards. So that's, I think, a, a question for every country to decide whether it just wants to say, well, I was not there at that time, so I just want to join it. 
or to say no this is useful for me it doesn't matter whether i was there at that time if it's helping me that's the merit is it helping me does it make sense for me is it useful for me not the politics of saying why wasn't i called to the party but saying do i have something to gain from it in my national interest and i just realized there are people waiting outside so thank you very much everybody we're going to have to close this up and keep watching this space thank you